Hello, everybody. I think I'd like to wait for others to join, but on the other hand, there are some fruitful discussions going on at the end of the session, so it is not so easy to end them on time. That's why I think uh, we can just start, and if anyone comes, they can join us. So I would like to welcome a uh, most wonderful uh, colleague and now friend, uh, Candace Thompson. So my name is Ishin Ono. I am one of the co-curators, along with my dear colleague, Livia Alexander. Uh, we also have our most wonderful uh, curatorial assistant with us, uh, Shayna Yoshida. And uh, we are um, hosting this event, uh, or at least the hosting uh, institution is Residency Unlimited. And uh, to get all together as a small team, we created this two days uh, symposium and uh, exhibition, uh, tackling one of the most urgent questions of our time. How will we feed ourselves given the intensif intensifying challenges of food insecurity and climate change? We started with this uh, question. And uh, of course, there have been so many other questions opened up uh, from this. Part of our thinking in putting together this symposium has been coming together to explore visions and proposals about how we as indiv individuals can participate in food resilience, hearing from individuals whose research is based on alternative methods of food production, behavior in daily life, what can be changed. And for this session, we are pleased to welcome Candace Thompson, who defines herself as a human being who collaborates with soil, plants, microbes, fungi, fungi, right? Animals, food, land, digital media, and other human beings in search of healing, resilience, and mutualism as we face the climate crisis. Her project, the Collaborative Urban Resilience Banquet, Banquet which is C-U-R-B, or would you call it CURB, uses citizen science, non-human storytelling, and forage community meals to unpack the complexities of edible urban ecosystems and imagine a future where the streets are clean enough to eat off. She's also the manager of Solar First Stuart Stuyvesant Co Park, excuse my pronunciation, a two acre uh, native food forest in lower Manhattan, where the public is encouraged to forage from clean land atop a former industrial site. So Candace Thompson is an artist, citizen, scientist, activist, and land steward who collaborates. Um, oh, I'm just repeating, I think, what some of the information we collected here. So I just leave the microphone to uh, Candace. Thank you so much, Candace, for being with us. Thank you, Ishan. And thank you to Olivia and Shana as well. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. So uh, thank you all for being here. You know, I've been doing a bunch of artist Zoom talks all year. We're all, we've all been doing a lot of Zooming and I've been using the same kind of played out slide deck and I just wanted to do something a little different. And I also, in my practice, I'm in a bit of a, a different moment. I'm in a moment of input, not output. I'm, I'm after kind of a very strange and intense year where a lot of things about my life have changed. I'm thinking a lot about what, where I go from here. And so today I, I want to share with you just some of the things that I'm researching and thinking about. And I'm going to try and like get through my spiel as quick, quick as I can um, without speaking a thousand miles an hour is my goal. Uh, so that we can have a little bit of a conversation about some of these things, because I think they impact all of us. So away we go. Um, let's see here. Share. So now you should be able to see my screen. Yep, delightful. Okay, so I've been taking a, a landscape design class at the Botanical Gardens, because now that I have to manage a public landscape, not only do I have to make it functional, it has to be pretty. And in that process, I've been learning a little bit about the history of landscape design. Um, you know, the ways that people across the globe and through cultures have gardened and the philosophies and the contexts and the ecosystems that have mandated those things. And it was really cool to learn about ancient Persian gardens, um, particularly a type of garden called a paradise garden. Um, these are four, they're often square, they often have four quadrants that symbolize kind of um, not only kind of the order of the cosmos, they also symbolize the um, like the, the essential components of the earth. So uh, 
soil, fire, water, wind. I guess none of them watched Captain Planet because it doesn't have heart. Um, they are often walled. And what I thought is really amazing is that both in these gardens and then the kind of predecessors, the ones that come after that, so Islamic gardens, uh, Indian gardens, you know, things like the Taj Mahal and the Alhambra, in all of them, they represent this kind of um, perfect harmony between man and nature. This Edenic, if you will, state where, where um, you know, everybody's just chilling, copacetic, and everything's lovely. And, you know, I've been thinking a lot about walls and containers and confinements, right? And when you look at something like this uh, garden here, you can understand why there need to be walls there, right? You're growing a garden. These gardens often have water through the center and use um, very um, creative uh, irrigation techniques. If you didn't have that wall there, sandstorms would come through, the whole thing would be super arid. It just would not function that way. In medieval Europe, you had to have walls around your gardens because wolves were like a thing, but sadly they're not a thing that much anymore. And so we've always kind of like created this boundary between what is like the wild, what is outside and what is like controlled by man and on the inside. And that got me thinking about the word forest, which is a Latin word. It is one of the places our word forest comes from. But surprisingly, it ain't got nothing to do with trees. The word forest means things like door, gate, opening. The adverb form means outside or outdoors. And in fact, mm -hmm. in English, the root of the word forest first comes into kind of common usage when William the Conqueror comes to England and he does this huge survey of, of English land and he's like, oh, that's a pretty nice spot. That's a pretty nice spot. These are going to be royal forests and me and my boys can hunt here and no one else is allowed to touch them. It had nothing to do with what was on the land. It had everything to do with who was allowed to access it. Mm -hmm. The same is true of parks. So a park, right? Oh, you can't see the sweet picture here. So a park um, was a deer park. So it was a space in which deer could get in, but they could not get out. And then you could go in and hunt them for sport or he could rent it out to his aristocratic buddies and be like, hey, you wanna go hunt some deer. Prior to that, most land outside of kind of a manor was just common land. And it was where the commoners, so that's me and you, my friends, where the commoners could go and pick up their firewood, they could graze their animals, they could grow a little farm, they could uh, forage for medicine or food. That was everyone's, right? And it was only through these processes in which they started to kind of draw these lines between haves and have nots. And it continued to be further codified through the acts of enclosure. So from about the 1300s to the 1800s, all across Europe, uh, governments start kind of um, consolidating land into uh, private property. So all of a sudden you're now, uh, oh, so this was common land. Well, now this is going to be a farm and it's going to belong to that guy. And he's going to grow, uh, he's going to cultivate sheep for wool. It started to become about cash crops. It was no longer about subsistence farming. And if you read Marx, which honestly I haven't, um, he, complain, he, he uh, suggests that these acts of enclosure, this 500 year process of dispossessing uh, peasants from the land prompted a drive to cities. It then gave, the, gave us a working class of people who had to sell their labor to the capitalist system, right? I don't know, maybe that's true. And then of course, those same Europeans come to America, hurt people, hurt people. So uh, then we've got manifest destiny. And I guess in somebody's conception, it looked like this, like some half naked Karen traipsing across the West. In this process, of course, native peoples were uh, violently dispossessed of their land and their ancestral connection to it, their ability to survive. Bison were killed in massive numbers um, intentionally to starve indigenous communities uh, into submission. And our country's wealth was built not only on that stolen land, but the stolen labor and stolen uh, agricultural knowledge of the Africans that we brought here against their will, who were smart enough to braid their seeds into their hair and take them on the middle passage because they knew wherever they were going, they would need to be able to feed themselves. Thus sparking uh, the rice industry of the South, the cotton industry, the indigo industry, all the things that have made America as great as it might be today. And 
this doesn't stop, right? So then you've got uh, the Civil War. And after the Civil War, it was something like 14% of farmland was owned by Black farmers. Today, they own less than 1%. And that isn't because they didn't want to farm. It was because of Jim Crow era uh, terrorization. Uh, it was because of racist land practices and mortgage lending techniques, you know, the uh, rural equivalent of redlining, um, USDA kind of intentionally denying black folks access to land. And indigenous folks to this day are continuing to have to struggle every freaking week mm -hmm. to have the right to their land and to have sovereignty over what does and doesn't happen on their land. Often they don't have clean drinking water, but they sure as hell have a gas pipeline that's trying to come through. And I bring all of this up, A, because it needs to always be brought up, but B, I bring it up because I think that one of the underlying reasons why I do what I do is because I feel like this disconnection from land, this severance of our um, ecological umbilical cord, if you will, has prompted a type of ecological illiteracy that I think is at the core of, of what's going on for us. And and for me, reconnecting to land has been so uh, transformative. And I see and have heard numerous times now the ways in which this kind of ability to reconnect and to start to pay attention again to seasons or plants or seeds or birds or whatever you might find interesting about our ecosystem really kind of helps people reconnect. And so, you know, and I'm having, and, and, and we see this ecological literacy every single day, right? Yeah, I, mm -hmm. I, and I get it. I get it. If you live in a city and you've never been out of it, you own nothing. I don't own anything. You, you own nothing. You've been told your life doesn't matter. Why would you give a shit about what you throw on the ground, right? You're going to walk out of the bodega and you're going to throw your gloves and your mask on the ground because you have no understanding that it is a, 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 a whole, right? A holistic system. And so for me, that is kind of where my work stems from, is me trying to kind of um, reclaim this notion of the commons that we lost uh, hundreds of years ago, right? And so sometimes that involves jumping over fences and abandoned lots and picking mugwort and, um, you know, hosting events where I kind of take people around and try to show them and teach them about these beings who share uh, urban space with us. But sometimes it also, this year, it included... Um, doing a project with another group of food justice organizers where we broke down an urban farm at JFK that was made out of milk crates with clean soil. And we took those 3000 milk crates and we distributed them to, I think like 500 households and like 30 different community groups throughout the five boroughs so that they could have a little mini paradise garden in their back porch or at their community garden. And they could either grow food for their community or they could try and grow a tomato plant for the first time in their freaking life. There's an emergency outside. So, uh, yeah, so I thought I would show you this. This is, um, I, for two years, I had grant money to do these, uh, do these toxicity tests where I would forage feral edible plants from around my neighborhood and then I would send them to Cornell to find out their heavy metal analysis. And this was back when I was pretty organized. So I made this Google map of all the places where I had foraged them from. And this is where I keep my data. I look expressly at arsenic, cadmium, and lead because they are three of the um, heavy metals most common in urban environments. And they are three of the heavy metals most common in our food system. And I compare anything I forage to the EU standards. So the European Union standards for heavy metals in our food system. Uh, after this is over, I'm happy to share links to any of these things in case you want to check them out. You might be wondering, and many people ask, why I don't use the USA's uh, standards for heavy metals in our food system, and that is because we don't have any. Uh, what we have instead is something called the total diet study. So let's see. So this is a system by which a bunch of people, and I'd like to think they're in lab coats, go to grocery stores across the country, they pull a bunch of stuff off the shelves, they go back to their lab, I guess, and they cook it. And then they test what is in the cumulative like holistic meal. So instead of testing the tuna and the noodles and the mushroom soup, they test the tuna noodle casserole. But if you wanna look at some of the things on this list with me, you'll notice that a lot of it is like processed, prepared food, it's interesting to me because like 
I mean, I think we've all understood at this point that the standard American diet isn't exactly super healthy anyways. So Mm -hmm. like necessarily just looking at the arsenic and the lead kind of also misses the point a little bit. And I can see why they do this. I can see the benefit of a holistic, a more holistic study, but I don't think it quite goes far enough. And one of the things that I've started to run into in my work is that I would serve these banquets in which I had toxicity tested what I could and was serving the things that seemed clean enough. And then I'd have people say, oh, Candace tested this, it's safe. I can't tell you what's safe. The US government can't tell you what's safe. The EU can't tell you what's safe. It's not that they've said, oh, well, this much arsenic is okay in your body, this much isn't. It's how much arsenic is in the general rice supply. And then they go, eh, eh. And so this is for me about kind of like questioning our notions of purity and asking us to not stop thinking about how we eat. You know, capitalism loves to just like give you a brand or give you a like a tag word and then be like, cool, you don't have to stop thinking. You don't have to think anymore. Just buy, just buy, it'll be fine. And like, I'm here to tell you, I personally don't think that's something we can afford to do anymore. Um, Because, you know, we can look at the heavy metals all day long and we can talk about that as much as we'd like, but let's also talk about um, the perfluoral alkyls, the, uh, the, the forever chemicals that are now in all of our rainwater. So whether you're buying organic or not, every time your lettuce that comes from Whole Foods get rained on, it's covered in PFAs. Uh, They're in the drinking water where my father lives. We go out, we go fishing. What are we eating, right? Where I'm from, Eastern Kentucky, Ohio, West Virginia, we've got Teflon, there's Teflon in all of our drinking water, all of the bodies of water all across across this country, probably most of the world, it's in our bodies. Uh, there's PCBs in our fish, there's polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons in our food. I mean, where do we even begin to assess what is and isn't healthy at this point? There's no one who could be uh, a placebo or an, 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 a, like an isolated uh, test case, right? We're all in it. We're all swimming in this chemical soup. And for me, I wonder what a, to- a total diet study would look like that not only takes into consideration all of those toxins that we humans have now put into our ecosystem, but also thinks about all of the social aspects of what our diet includes. So, you know, how well are the people who are growing your food getting treated? Are they getting paid enough? Do they have health care? Are they being sexually assaulted regularly? Because that's a thing that happens a lot. And so for me, it's like, how do we even begin to deal with like the, the mess of how our global food system works. And how do, how do we create interventions that keep people thinking about and talking about how it works so that we can try and make it um, in better relationship. And so, you know, one of the examples that I will give that I find very frustrating is, you know, sometimes, look, a plant-based diet, yes, we can all say like, we should all eat a more plant-based diet. But to think that you're vegan and that you can just stop thinking about it is erroneous. Because in actual fact, you might be getting vegan chocolate that was harvested by an eight-year-old child slave in Africa. If you're eating plants at all, if you're drinking almond milk, for instance, I'm here to tell you that you are complicit in bees, billions of bees, getting on flatbed trucks and being shipped all over the country nine months out of the year. And if there's anything we've learned this year, when we travel, we uh, share our biomes, right? We get sicker easier. We have colony collapse disorder. All these bees are traveling all together, going, pollinating all the same plants, getting sick. If they die, we screwed, right? And so to even think that like, oh, my life is cruelty free. Like, I'm sorry, none of us get out of this scot-free. None of us do. And in fact, we have evolved our agricultural practices, our good ones, to work in collaboration with non-human beings, plants, animals, microbes, fungi, et cetera, right? Should we have CAFOs, the, you know, these massive animal farms where, um, oop, I can't touch my lab t- last tab, where, you know, cows are just kept in confinement? No, should we be eating a steak for every meal? No, in fact, I would argue that if you eat meat, you should have to kill one of your animals that you eat every year so that you can remember just how hard and how sacred that act should be. But on the flip side, one of the tenets of regenerative agriculture is working with animals. They're they're clutch in how we manage land. They help us clean up after we harvest, say, a field of corn. 
They put fertilizer in the form of poop back into that soil. It so solves us the problem of having to use manufactured uh, herbicides, pesticides, fertilizers, gas fed tractors. And if you're gonna raise a herd of cattle to do that, you might as well make some breed in my humble opinion. And so, yeah, so just thinking about our food system, right? Is just such a, 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 it's really hard to wrap your head around, right? And so what are these interventions we can do that kind of get people some of that ecological literacy back? So um, yeah, this year I got a job. I got a full-time job for the first time in my life. Uh, and um, we, I am now a manager of a park in, in lower Manhattan, a food forest. And we weren't in the park for uh, the majority of the lockdown, March, April, May, and the beginning of June. And our park is run by two people, myself and my coworker, Caesar, and then usually like an army of, of volunteers. But because of the pandemic, obviously there was nobody there. So the park did what parks do and the bindweed, um, which is a very aggressive, invasive, if you wanna use this term plant, went ham and uh, ate our entire nursery, like something out of a sci-fi movie. There was no way that I could handle this much biomass on my own. Trying to pull it out would have like eaten up my whole life. Trying to compost it down would have been virtually impossible. So I asked my job if I could hire 20 goats. And so for three days, 20 goats came and hung out in our park. I hung out with them. We all slept in the park for three days together. And they did a bang up job, y'all, of doing what goats have done in collaboration with us for the past 10,000 years. They ate all the bindweed. I went through the park. We had a bunch of um, kind of rogue mulberry trees. We went through, we cut them down. I'd, I'd chuck them in the fence where they were and they love mulberries in case you're wondering. And it was beautiful because not only did it help me do my job better, but it was this amazing chance for me to connect with this community to which I was now kind of a servant, right? And so what was really funny is that everybody just thought I'd brought them as like a, like a petting zoo or like a lark, you know? And I'd be like, no, no, they're here, they're working. And like, I got to really teach that to the little kids when I drag a mulberry tree over and pull branches off and be like, okay, kiddos, here you go. You can feed this to them. We're, we're using them as walking composters and could explain to them how this cycle, how this closed loop practice was going to help us all do our job. And in the meantime, everybody got to hang out with some really delightful goats. Everything that was left, so they eat only the green stuff. So they left me a bunch of brush in an attempt to once again, close the loop, keep this cycle going. Uh, we built some hugels. So that's German for mound. This is an ancient European land building practice where you bury logs and then you cover it in soil. And as, those, as that wood matter breaks down, it creates this very microbially, fungally rich growing medium that stays moist longer, stays warm longer because it's composting down and extends your growing season. Uh, in exchange for the people who came and helped me, because I did put them through the paces with the shoveling, I did a little mini curb banquet. I served them some um, acorn muffins with uh, beach plum jam that was uh, collected from the park, um, some linden tea that I'd foraged in Bushwick, and some chaga coffee. And this is one of my other hoogles. It's covered in a, a nitrogen-fixing uh, winter cover crop. I look at this and I see like my child. I'm like, that's the most beautiful thing. I know it just looks like a mound of grass to you, but like I, this is the, the that was so hard what I built there. Um, and what you see in the foreground here, this green kind of cover crop that you see in the front is a plant called cleavers, which is a weed um, that grows abundantly in my park. I'm trying to make sure it doesn't go to seed. So I've been harvesting some of it. It's an amazing medicine. I actually take it every day. It's really good for clearing your lymph. I've been harvesting it and putting it in little bundles and giving it out to people and telling them what they can do with it. So these kinds of actions are the kind of stuff I do in this park on a daily basis because they are a chance for me to kind of sow those seeds of, of ecological literacy or, or of, 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 you know, one little stitch in reattaching our umbilical cord, if you will. But it ain't all sunshine and roses. Uh, it is an urban space. And remember we were talking about walls there are no walls and there shouldn't be, but it's an urban space and public spaces of which there are not many in urban spaces end up becoming the catch-all for our society's failings. On a regular basis, 
not daily, but at least once a week, I clean up dirty needles. I clean up human shit. I clean up trash. Somebody left a whole bucket of KFC chicken on a bench the other day, a whole bucket. Uh, I have folks who do not have the luxury of housing, the privilege of housing, uh, uh, who live under the FDR right next to my park. Some of them sometimes try to live in the park. I am a gardener, but I also end up having to be a bit of a social worker and I'm here for it. I, I'm excited to be able to engage with folks like the people who left this mattress here. They were a family. I had great conversations with them. There was a guy named D who had a whole camp. I went to his, I went to his house and he had art on the walls. Stylish dude. I also had some very difficult conversations with a guy named Y who was setting up a tent, basically a tarp in the park over and over again. And I, I don't want to have to do this, but it's my job to be like, you, 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 you can't do this. He doesn't, he doesn't have very good mental skills. So like he'd say, okay, or he'd nod. And then the next day he'd still be there. And at some point, like, what am I supposed to do? You know? And so I'm trying to figure out how I, I take the fact that I am working in this democratic space and that I, that these, these stakeholders are very much so a part of my reality and figure out how I work with that. Right. And what are the boundaries between what is my job making $25 an hour, basically. Um, and where does my job start and stop here? And so this is what I really wanted to share with you is that I'm, I'm struggling with some of these things. I've come up with some solutions so far. So for the, for the poop of it all, um, we started renting to uh, porta johns One of them was liberated pretty quickly. So the lock was broken on it. And I was just like, well, okay, that sounds fine. So now I have one that's locked and I can like give people access to it because if you live in New York, you know there's no access to public bathrooms. And the other one's open all the time. So far that system seems to be working out. Sometimes they come to clean out the toilets and the hoses get stuck because they're full of needles. This becomes my problem because our society hasn't dealt with it, right? And so I've been looking at, at solutions that exist. So this is a company called Portland Lou. They have these toilets that they've designed that are supposed to be kind of graffiti free and supposed to, I don't know what they're supposed to do, but they seem pretty fancy. I've been reading a lot about how, you know, the legalization or the decriminalization of, of drugs in Portugal, but more importantly, the fact that they started actually supporting um, people through their addiction process, getting them the mental health care that they need that we all need to be able to kick our addictions, because let's be clear, we're all addicted to something. I've been reading about how in Finland, they've started providing housing, not shelters, housing to people who need it. Go figure, what a radical idea. And of course, I've been thinking about the Green New Deal. And I've been thinking about how we could be reinvesting in our communities so that we are, are working towards the future we need. I have homeless folks who come through and offer to help me and like want to get a job. And sometimes they work with me and I give them cash out of my own pocket. I wish to God I had a budget to be able to pay some folks and I could teach them things. I could teach them how to compost. I could teach them how to start seeds. I could give them not full-time jobs or anything, but I could be investing back into the community and creating like, I don't know, something, a different model if we had the money to do that. And, you know, I don't, I just wanted to let you know, if you don't know that New York City is about to lose uh, some of its most important um, composting sites, and we should all be screaming at the top of our lungs about it, because it is actually moving backwards. If we think we're going to try and get to climate neutral by 2030 or 2050 or whatever it is, we're playing ourselves because we're, we're going backwards. And as Asuncion said in her talk earlier today, uh, topsoil is one of our most precious resources and we're losing it and we need to be building it like gangbusters. Ah, right. And so, you know, these are all grand, beautiful ideas, right? That we could like, I don't know, provide housing and mental health care and, you know, health care in general. Well, crazy. Um, and because I'm speaking sort of on behalf of my job in this talk, I probably have to be a little careful about kind of being too political maybe. So I'm going to just show you some tabs of places where I think maybe some money for that could come from with no comment. Wow, $11 billion, that's a lot of money. Wow, okay. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, $13 billion, you make Oxycontin. Yeah, you got everybody addicted and now you're making money. Good job. 
Wow. Go you. Hmm. Interesting. Huh. No, no, no. It, you, how much? That's a lot of billions. That's like, that's a lot of billions. That's a lot of billions. Hmm. Oh, just one off wealth tax. I wonder if that could work here. Oh, it's probably too crazy to never work. <laughs> <clears throat> so uh, I've been reading this. Um, I'm almost done. I've been reading uh, Eleanor Ostrom's uh, Governing the Commons. If you don't know who Eleanor Ostrom is, she was an economist who won the Nobel Prize for her work researching how communities manage common spaces and common resources. Um, she kind of wrote her work uh, flying in the face of this notion of the tragedy of the commons, the idea that we all can't just get along. And in her book, she highlights several kind of case studies of communities who do this. So like communal grazing lands in, the, in Switzerland or uh, fishing communities in Nova Scotia and how they kind of share their resources for the common good and self-govern. And in her situation, in her work, she defines uh, that there's kind of eight principles for managing a commons. So I wanted to share them with you because we're all commoners together. I think words like peasant, commoner have been uh, Sadly, in uh, English in particular, kind of like um, they're, they're very, we have a lot of class bias in our culture. And uh, I would like us to kind of reclaim those kinds of notions um, because they're pretty awesome. Uh, and these are the kinds of things that we would do if we were going to figure out how we manage our commons. And we could say that's everything from a public park to our whole bloody planet better. You know, so boundaries. Right, this idea of like what is enclosed, what is not, um, matching the needs and the conditions of the local community, uh, making sure that everyone has a say in the rules and how the rules get modified, um, making sure that whoever's enforcing the rules is perhaps maybe people from the community, um, and that there is a self-governing system, a self-accountability system, and um, and a, a punishment system, but that it is you know not too draconian. Um, and that there is a, a way to do that that does not have to involve like lawyers, for instance, right? All of this is really hard to do in a public park where on any given day, there's gonna be people who come every day and there's gonna be people who pass through for the first and last time in their life, right? But I will say, and I'll end with like a little bit of hope. And that is that um, I have in my short time in this park started to see this community um, in which I am now a member and, and, trying to, and starting to figure out who all the stakeholders are. So um, the UN International School, so the, the bright young minds who are the children of, of UN diplomats and dignitaries um, is right up the way from us. They actually approached me earlier this year about wanting to come and help pick up trash in the park. They're lovely. Um, they come and they pick up trash. They're gonna help me re-up our recycling situation. They're great. Um, I this past summer did a whole like solstice thing where I foraged a bunch of the like bindweed and heliopsis. I couldn't get nearly enough of it. The goats had to come. Um, and I made all these flower crowns and as people were coming through on their bikes, I'd be like, do you want a flower crown? And I met Scott who was delightful. Um, sometimes people, God, this little thing gets in my way. Um, it was also really beautiful to watch people uh, forage mulberries this spring. People of every different walk, color, creed, size, shape, age. I mean, you'd have like a, a, like a little hijabi girl like on her dad's shoulders eating mulberries next to like some like 75 year old like black guy next to like a Russian grandmother. It was, it was a Benetton ad, it was delightful. After mulberry season was over, the trees were a little worse for wear. Next year, I wanna be able to put up some signs that be like, you don't have to shake them to death. They'll come down on their own. And then I also have people who like use the space and don't even tell me about it. Uh oh, where'd it go? Like I had this person who planted a rogue cucumber, stop that, who planted a rogue cucumber in one of the beds and har harvested their cucumbers all summer. I'm here for it. I'd love it if you tell me so that we can collaborate, it, collaborate on it and make sure our plants are growing together. But like, I want people to use the space like this. That's fantastic to me. And lastly, I'll, I'll share this uh, anecdote that um, a couple weeks ago, I was, uh, I was getting done with my day and I saw these two fellas setting up a whole thing on one of the tables in the park. And it looked like they had a bottle of wine and I was like, okay, cool, I'll be back in about 15 minutes, y'all just hang on. And they laughed and I didn't think anything of it. 
And then I was coming back through. And when I did, they had sure enough, like set me down a cup and they were like, please join us. And what they were doing is they were having kava. These two, these two gentlemen were for, from Fiji and they uh, had gotten the kava. Their friends had harvested it in Fiji, processed it, sent it to them. And they were settling down for an evening of drinking kava together. I'd never had it. They taught me the whole thing. I did the like cupping thing. Um, it was delicious. And we had like a beautiful 30 minute conversation about plants and healing and community and culture. And that is why I do what I do. And I didn't even have to instigate that, they did. And so I'm excited to be working in public space because of things that I can intervene in this way and that other people can intervene in this way. And, um, you know, if you ever wanna come intervene with me, I hope you'll join me there sometime. It's on the East River between uh, 18th and 23rd Street. Soon it will be only the 18th, between 18th and 20th for a little while. And that is because, uh, oh, because an error occurred, because of climate change. Get to it. Oh, never mind. We're not going to talk about that. Uh, because of climate change, we're going to be having the park uh, demolished in parts and risen. The, there's going to be a seawall built. Um, but I hope that it will be a food forest for many years into the future. And uh, I hope to see you there, and I hope to see more food forests in general. Thanks.